Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and I'm bringing you something very special today. I'm bringing you an interview with Sami Loxo, who is the designer of Dawn of Peacemakers from Snowdale Design. How are you doing today, Sami? Hi Liz, I'm doing great, and thanks for thanks for uh, calling me. Yeah, thanks for being here. So Dawn of Peacemakers has a very interesting theme, which is that you are actually attempting to stop two opposing armies from fighting as opposed to being part of the fight yourself. What inspired you to design a game with this theme? Uh, the origin story of the game uh, did, of course, uh, at this time, uh, did start from the team itself. And it was just that I was thinking about what I would like to design next after after doing the deck building game, uh, Dale of Merchants. And I wanted to do something something with a bit more scale. And uh, the first thing that, uh, of course, comes to mind is, is that uh, what about some kind of war game and lots of stuff going on on the game board and stuff, things like that. But uh, immediately after that thought, I think that there's already plenty of war games out in the out in the world. And how about uh, turning that idea upside down and uh, players actually trying to achieve peace in the game and what that would uh, mean mechanics wise and uh, and and theme wise as well and that's that's where the spark came from for the game so what's interesting however about your peacemaking game is that it's not a game where you make peace through something like diplomacy you are actually using a different set of methods to get the two armies to de-escalate their conflict so you want to talk about why you chose the partic- particular methods you chose and give us a brief rundown of what those are well, uh, it came mostly at that point after I had designed the two armies and how they would uh, uh, war against each other. And then what? Af- after that, the next thought it is that how how would the players influence the war to try to stop it? And uh, when when war is as far as it is, so they they're actually fighting against each other, the two nations. Uh, at that point, there's not that much room for diplomatic uh, maneuvers, at least not on the battlefield. If you would like to try to stop the war more peacefully, then you wouldn't be actually see, looking at the at the battlefield on the board. So that's why the players are what we call adventurers, and uh, they are uh, influencing the tides of war right there on the battlefield. And the means of doing so can be a bit shady and. Uh, that why why the players do what they do is uh, <laughs> will be explained more thoroughly on the on the actual game and uh, all the, all the flavors flavors found in there. Right. So I mean, we are supposed to be the good guys, but my favorite card in the game is probably the one where you give the army that you're with food poisoning. Um, yes. <laughs> and you can also you know do things like interfere with orders, send false orders. So are we really the good guys in this scenario? Why would well, anybody trust uh, us? <laughs> at, at least your uh, the, what you want to achieve is uh, quite noble, whereas you want to stop the war. But there's a, like a third party, uh, a chameleon named Meron that has sent you on the battlefield. And he is more of the good guy that you are talking about right now. And you're like his hands uh, in, in, in the battlefield. And you're not actually peacemakers in in the game when you start start playing it and you're just a uh, pretty selfish uh, adventures who are just there for for the money or some other reason that uh, motivates your particular uh, adventure and meron is just uh, hoping for you to do the best as you can to achieve peace and he's probably not too fond of the methods that you <laughs> you you do in order to achieve that goal <laughs> okay so this is really interesting so Marin doesn't necessarily have any particular methods in mind. So just for context, those of you who have not yet played Dawn of Peacemakers, in the game, you are it's some adventurers and you have interesting pasts. So you might have been travelers or you might have been mischief makers in various parts of the world, but you're, you're sneaky, you're smart, you have some life skills. And so you've all been gathered together by Marin, who is this aging chameleon who sends you letters about what he'd like you to do. So basically we are doing Marin's dirty work. Yeah, is and the... <laughs> uh, even the, the whole game is basically Meron's plan B. He never wanted to war even uh, start, but uh, as he 
so that uh, it might be inevitable, inevitable that uh, it will begin. This is his uh, alternative plan on on try to try to handle it and uh, lower the blood set as much as he can. <laughs> All right, so this is interesting too, though, because so we are using some slightly sketchy ways to achieve peace. But the other thing that's that I've wondered throughout the game, right, is should we be trying that hard to achieve peace at all in the sense that in your story, and because this is true from the get-go, I don't feel like this is a spoiler, um, the Macaw Nation is aggressive towards the Ocelots, who didn't do anything wrong. So you know, in ethical terms, one side really seems like it's more right than the other side. So how did you reconcile that? Did you have any playtesters who had feelings about that? You know, why did you choose to do the story that way? I'm just really curious about it. Well, it, uh, you, for, for a fact, uh, usually in our history, when there's a war, there's usually an aggressor and one that's uh, less to blame for, for the war. So that's one one reason that we took the approach we the, took, and on another is of course it uh, offers more more things to think about for the players. It's not uh, we are not uh, trying to uh, give you the answers to uh, to these complicated questions, but more or less get you thinking about them and discussing with with uh, with others. And if we manage to do that, then we're uh, more than happy and. Uh, believe that we have accomplished <laughs> what we tried to do with the game. <laughs> um, are you yourself a pacifist? Like, does this game uh, reflect your own beliefs about how the world should be? Uh, pretty much, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, of course, the methods of uh, stopping the war and things like that, that's a bit more nuanced. And of course, I hope that I never need to go be in a situation where I have to do <laughs> the decisions that you will do as you, as a player <laughs> in, in the game. <laughs> um, so the other question, a general question I have before I ask a couple of nitpicky mechanical sort of questions is why South America? So Dawn of Peacemakers is set in an alternative version of South America where instead of humans evolving to create civilizations, animals have done so instead. So what interested you about this area of the world and you know what sort of research did you do to create the game world there? Uh, well, we have created the whole game world, which is uh, called Daimuria, and uh, it has all, uh, the whole world as we we know it. But as you uh, told already, there's no no humans. So uh, after that, it was just uh, where do we want to locate the game uh, Dawn of Peacemakers in in this world? So for example, the Dale of Merchants uh, deck building game. The first part takes place uh, somewhere in the middle of Europe. So this time we wanted something, something totally different and introduce more, uh, more uh, local things from a different part of of the game world. So uh, South America f- felt felt like a good fit for this, as we wanted to tell more about the story about uh, what kind of uh, animal folks the ocelots and scarlet macaws are, and from the elements we had already ten uh, decided that they come from South America. So it's it was uh, one reason was that the uh, folks are are origin is from South America in the in the game world. So that's why we decided to uh, place Dawn of Peacemakers there. Awesome. All right. So. I reviewed your game, and I reviewed it positively, but when you saw my initial review, you had a couple of corrections for me on terminology, which I thought was very interesting. Um, And I can admit to my mistakes, but... (laughs) Yeah, I don't uh, don't, uh, critique when people uh, think, for example, dislike my games or anything like that, because that's, of course, uh, people's different opinions, but uh, uh, we have... Uh, used a lot of time on terminals, uh, all the terms in the, used on uh, in my games, and uh, in in addition, of course, the artwork and game design, all all of that. So, I just like to point out if there uh, sometimes people are using a different uh, term for for a thing. But what I actually thought was interesting is looking back at the terms that I had used versus the technical ones in the game. So. I thought it was very interesting that those mattered so much, and I wanted to talk about why, other than for technical reasons. So when you... one of the, the main win condition in the game is to reduce these two sides 
who are very aggressive towards each other to a state where both are kind of demotivated enough to withdraw from contact from from combat so you get you need to lower their motivation and i had initially referred to it as morale what is the difference between those two words for you uh was it just sort of just a technical thing because it was the technical term that you used or do they have a different meaning for you that affects the way the game feels yeah for for me at least personally individuals can have morale morale on and it's it's it has more to do what uh, what do you think is right and what do you think is wrong. So th- in that uh, in that case, it's kind of hard to say that someone has a high morale and someone has a low morale. It's lo- lo- more like a, you have different morale and you uh, value different things. But motivation is how much do you want to continue doing some particular thing. So for example, the uh, sides uh, for in the game have. Uh, have motivation to continue the war. They don't have a morale to continue to continue the war. So that's uh, at least the difference difference for me for those two terms. Interesting. And the other one that we talked about that I thought was very interesting was that when units are taken out of play because they're injured, because you food poisoned them, you know, <laughs> you yeah. were very interested in me describing them as disabled. Yeah, uh, I got the term that I, we use on the rules is uh, defeated. Defeated, so yeah. so you're you're interested in the idea that they were defeated, but did not really like that I was describing units dying. Yeah, there are of course in war there are mul- uh, of course in in the game when uh, one one miniature in the game it represents uh, multiple soldiers on the battlefield. So even if there's just like let's say uh, ten miniatures on the board, there's still like at least 50 uh, units fighting on the battlefield or even more depending on which scenario you're playing. Uh, when a single miniature's health uh, is reduced to zero, it uh, the- thematically, in, in team-wise, we see that uh, most of those units that are, are represented by a, a single miniature are just not uh, battle operational anymore. So some of them are, of course, killed, but some of them just are wounded uh, uh, so heavily that they can't continue can't continue fighting. So that's what we, why we call them uh, uh, defeated because war isn't just uh, black and white where everyone is ki- either killed or they are alive and fully operational. So the health going below zero basically means that they can't fight anymore. Not all of them are killed. Right, but do you think that? That focusing on that downplays the amount of death that there is in scenarios where you're successful? Because in scenarios where you're successful, yeah, they they become less motivated and then they withdraw. But if enough units are defeated, you know, from your own... I was, like, looking through the text of, like, lost scenarios, where it would say things like, bloody conclusion of the fight. Where, you know, it is getting pretty bad when you you lose enough units. Enough units are defeated, but not dead yeah we just wanted to use a more like a neutral term game gameplay wise Mm -hmm. when a unit can't be uh, operational anymore and then the actual flavor text after each uh, scenario should give uh, more idea on what actually happened on the on the battlefield so sometimes they are uh, less (laughs) less killed and (laughs) sometimes there's there's more bloodshed so in example the one that you you just uh, quoted (laughs) Um, if they would say always that they are killed or that they are just wounded when the HP goes zero, then we would have uh, less room to play with the flavor text and uh, le- we would also leave less space for players' imagination on what happens on the battlefield as well. Right. So the other thing that makes that interesting, right, is is it is it also about what feels ethically better for the player, be- you know, to have a unit defeated instead of totally destroyed because you as a player do frequently line up those enemies to take damage or damage them yourself with some of the cards that are available in the game. So is is calling a unit defeated also a way of making a player feel a little bit less sketchy when they interfere with that unit? Maybe so. And for example, with the food poisoning, the example that you gave, you can uh, see that they, they are less uh, op- uh, operational in uh, in that sense that they can't fight as well, but maybe they didn't actually take any uh, physical damage actually. So they mm-hmm. 
could, for example, just have a bad bad nausea or something something like that, and after then getting hit by an enemy, they just uh, the uh, motivation of that single single unit goes to zero, and you are remove them from the play because th that actually miniature which represents the units can't uh, or don't want to fight anymore. So it you can uh, kind of create your own head cannon on what happens on the battlefield on the any particular game that you're playing. It doesn't really make sense for food poisoning to actually cut your limbs off or anything like that. I don't know, man. I've had some pretty bad food poisoning. <laughs> 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 so, um, just a couple more questions. Uh, I actually noticed something that I liked a lot about your game, which was gender equality among the um, commanders of the armies. Is that something that you deliberately made an effort to do coming in? Because I noticed that all the different armies had several female commanders. Yep, that's uh, something that we uh, ha had a lot of thought put into and made made sure that they have pretty much equal amount of uh, female and male uh, leaders, and as well as the uh, playable characters are also two males and two females, if you look closely on the, on the flavor text of those as well. But we didn't want to uh, underline it. So, so if you if you notice it, great. If you don't, uh, it doesn't really hurt hurt the game. And it's also uh, supposed to tell more about the game world as well, because mm -hmm. they are animals and they don't in, in their world they don't really care too too much if if one particular individual is female or or male at least at the time of war. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I actually really liked how seamless it was. I noticed that the way that you presented it was just, it was a natural part of the game world. There wasn't a lot of attention flagged to it, but it was there and I really appreciated it. So I'm really glad that you made that effort because Thank I think you. I'd be a great military commander. No. <laughs> so the other thing that I really enjoyed in some of your game was that, so if both of the sides are simultaneously defeated and they don't lose motivation and withdraw, your flavor text for this is hilarious. So basically, apparently, this is the rarest way to lose, correct? But yeah, that is down, correct. <laughs> you managed to lose in quite an interesting way. It's, what did I say? It's rare to be so disastrously unsuccessful. <laughs> <laughs> I, we, it, it, it's so rare for that to happen, but it's still possible. So the rulebook has to cover that part and... Why not make it uh, memorable if, if that ever happens to a game group? <laughs> yeah, it hasn't happened to me in any of my games yet, but I gotta tell you, I'm kind of hoping it does, that I can, <laughs> I can earn that text. <laughs> oh man, I really enjoyed that a lot. Yeah, more, the, the other outcomes are usually more uh, grounded, but that, that is of co mo most often a bit, it, bit more out there, and we try to make that a small joke if 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 that ever happens have you seen it happen uh on the on the play tests i think i did see it happen once or twice or something like that but that's across <laughs> like ten, uh, hundreds of games or something like that <laughs> have, have you rare. ever done it to yourself when you're playing uh without spoiling too much maybe <laughs> <laughs> but there probably was a purpose for me to do so <laughs> Oh, so it's all in the all in the spirit of testing. You would never lose that way on your own. Yeah, of course, <laughs> of course not. <laughs> so I have one more question for you. So those of you who want one hundred percent no spoilers, this is very minor um, spoilers, so you can stop here. But I wanted to ask. So at the very end of the game, you talk, just talked about the adventurers being interested in different ways of of bringing about peace because even if they all kind of started at the beginning of the adventure, they, um, as, as a sort of wild things who weren't super into the mission, by the end, they're quite interested. And, you know, they're talking about things like preventing wars before they even start and all these different like options for creating peace. Are you planning to try to bring any of those to life in a future installment of this series? Uh, if, if the, if the base game is, uh, successful i do have a lot of plans for different expansions that would uh expand uh, expand the game in various ways uh introducing new 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 ca uh, campaigns and uh, new units and all kinds of 
all kinds of stuff that uh, has hasn't been done at all in the in the base game. So if if there ever, ever will be an expansion, which I hope uh, or hope to do, uh, then it uh, will have pretty different uh, uh, different experience playing uh, when compared to the to the base game. I have to tell you, I personally am really interested in that. I really liked Donna Peacemakers. I thought it was thematically and mechanically really interesting. So I personally would like to see more. You can, you can of course, tell me all about it off camera. <laughs> um, and before we go, are there any other uh, interesting things you'd like to tell me about the future of Snow Design since you're here and we're listening? Well, I can uh, give a tiny, tiny sneak peek on the game that we are we're working right now. So if if Dawn of Peacemakers had more more theme and more flavor than uh, than uh, uh, Dale of Merchants, well, the next one will have <laughs> even more so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, color curious. Even, even even more story uh, oriented. All right, so thank you so much, Tommy, for for coming on, for giving us your time. Um, I really appreciated getting to talk to you about your game and I hope listeners that y'all did too. If you have any questions for Sami or me, please leave them in the comments. And again, Sami, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Litz, for inviting me and it was a pleasure. Happy gaming, guys.